and welcome to The Chrissy B Show. Now here at the only positive mental health show around, we feel, we feel it's our duty to talk about the sensitive subjects that people don't like to talk about, are afraid to talk about, or even sometimes embarrassed to talk about. And tonight is no different because we're going to discuss the problem of child depression. Now, according to the Young Minds charity, the voice for young people's mental health and well-being, depression occurs when sad feelings do not go away and when they overwhelm a person and stop them from doing the things they normally do. Now, it used to be thought that ch children and young people couldn't get depressed, but in fact they can, and they may just show it in different ways. And some of the, the things that actually can cause children and young people to become depressed include the following. Parents arguing, divorce or separation of their parents, the death of someone close to them, feeling rejected or left out within the family, problems with schoolwork or exam pressure, changing school or moving home, friendship problems, physical illness in themselves or a carer, and poverty or homelessness. So we're going to be talking about some of those issues throughout the show. Now, we do have some special guests with us today. First of all, we have Anne Alagbe, who'll be telling us her story about her very difficult struggles in the past. And we also have our resident consultant clinical psychologist, Dr. Nihara Krauss, who'll be giving us the full scientific background behind this condition. And later on, I'll be giving you my top tips on how to help your child if they're depressed. So do stay tuned for that. But first of all, it's the news with Helena Shard. Hello, Helena, how are Hi, you? Hi, Chrissy. Very good, thank you. So good to have you on. Thank now, you. this is a, a sensitive subject, but as we do on this show, we do tackle any yeah, subject that really affects people. Very interesting subject. I mean, heart rendering in places. I've done yeah. quite a bit of research, and it's quite interesting as well because lots of things are taken from a sort of a, a, a statistics from 2004, which mm. seems quite long ago. Yeah. But anyway, um, I just don't. I just don't ever recall people talking about child depression because you never imagine a child to be depressed. No, I mean, I, so I'm lucky, I don't, I don't suffer from it, but when looking into it, it's just immense yeah. and, as I said, heart-rendering, but very interesting. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think if everyone knows more about it, people can help everybody yeah. and it's a subject that yeah. can be tackled. Definitely. Anyway, so looking into things, um, statistics, just to give an idea, the Office of National Statistics um, gave some figures. Mm -hmm. So it's roughly in a class, a, a class of children, which is 25 to 35, there's normally three children um, that suffer from mental health problems, and joking? one of but one of those would be suffering from serious depression. So if you think how many classes oh there are, it's, it's, I didn't know it was very, that serious. That's very high. Wow. Yeah, and um, Nice N I C E. I mm. think that's how they say it. So the National Institute of Hair and Care and Excellence. Um, in 2013, they stated that 80,000 children suffered from severe depression, and 8,000 of these were under 10 years old. Wow. And that's just the UK, imagine worldwide. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's immense. And the charity place to be, that's very well known. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, um, I always forget her name, Camilla Batmangelida, who I've discussed before. You know, the lady that wears all the bright coloured yeah. curtains and yeah. things in her yeah. hair. She, she founded the um, place to be, which, which actually launched the first mental health, children's mental health week, February 2015, mm -hmm. which is so current. It's, yeah, you know, it yeah, just goes to show true. that now thinking about, you know, children and mental health um, and obviously the place to be, uh, which was founded in 1991, it, mm -hmm. it covers school based mental health, which is very clever. So it offers an emotional support service for children, mm -hmm. for like 80,000 children, as we discussed. And yeah. that um, one person that I was looking into, Winona Ryder, yeah. because she's so successful. Um, and she actually suffered, she started suffering from depression and panic attacks at the age of 12, 12, 12 years old. And by the age of what would 19, you know the reason for that? Or just, it just developed. Mm. I don't think there was actually, uh, they didn't say about her background or anything. Mm. There, there wasn't anything that was dubious there. Um, so at 19, she, yeah, she, she had psychiatric treatment, but she's done really well. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. There's a positive side yeah. to it. Um, well, this is the thing. This is why we do cover these topics because even though, like, there are so many children going going through this this period, and obviously the, yeah. the parents go through it as well with the child because yeah, the child is suffering, the, the the parents are as well. But at the same time, we're also showing people that recovery, full recovery, is possible. And it's talking about it and making yeah. it real, and it's not anything to be ashamed of. No, not at all. You know, you break your leg, you you, you have external injuries. There's nothing yeah. different really. You just mm -hmm. have to fix it. Yeah. 
That's and it. there's way, ways forward. Um, so, uh, so the World Health Organization in May 2014 found depression to be the number one cause of illness and disability in, in adolescents mm. worldwide. So the number one, I mean, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, and the reasons being, I know that you mentioned quite a few reasons, um, but a couple which I saw in the Telegraph, apart from what you said, I don't know if you mentioned, did you mention social media? Um, we're in no, this, because of our modern society, social media no, is so, so huge. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, children now are, are stressed, you know, from the age of five even so stressed with modern society and social media and if you think about you know people children used to be bullied in the, in the playground but now they take it home because there's cyberbullying which continues yeah, 24 yeah. 7. There's, I mean it's, it's, it's scary I mean we will really do a scary. whole show about this but there was uh, I think I've mentioned it on the show before I just I was in the park one day and I just saw parents talking together and then the child the, it was a baby it wasn't even like a toddler a baby mm. holding the phone just looking at it like this like mesmerized by this phone and I'm thinking it's not going to be long before yeah. he's on there doing and it's just yeah. like kids that they, they, it's like they're they don't notice it. things around them anymore they it's just they're just stuck computers on their phones and stress it's you know if it's not school work it's gonna affect them. games and yeah, things it's terrible gosh um media as well um again nice did a, a, a study and mm -hmm. body image and yes. wanting ideal lifestyles etc mm -hmm. which is which is unrealistic and people sort of model themselves on them and so yeah. they're not able to express themselves and, and have their true identity and develop in a sort of normal way mm -hmm. which is really quite big and um, you mentioned parents divorcing and I was reading a, a subject on Victoria Sellers who's Peter Sellers I didn't realize Peter Sellers was with Britt Eklund for a while uh -huh. and Victoria Sellers the daughter but had such a traumatic upbringing and they obviously had a very fiery relationship and she was mm -hmm. used as a pawn between oh. them both so at the age of three, she was going from one to the other. They didn't really want her, you know, she was looked after by the childminders, but mm. as a result, it, she went on to, you know, narcotics and prison, you know, everything. Oh, yeah. yeah, which is, which is um, really sad. Losing parents, um, mm. Bobby Christina, who's in the news today, actually, um, Whitney Houston's daughter. Mm. And she, unfortunately, was found in the bath like her mother yeah. which is like a, it's a common thing i was just thinking peaches geld off and her mom and what, yeah, what happened yeah. there but um that's really sad and last the last tweets on on facebook tweets twitter not mm -hmm. facebook yeah, i'm twitter. showing my age yeah. now <laughs> <laughs> which was saying you know miss you mummy and alert feel alone and then very quickly she was found but sadly she's going to be moved to a hospice so that's not sounding so positive there mm -hmm. genetics obviously um, thinking about it, the Osbournes, yeah. you know, uh, depression and obviously down through the children and all the other things that come with it. Um, also, I mean, Angelina. You can, you, I mean, obviously, I okay, know genetics, people say it's genetics as well, but just being around someone that's really down can make you feel down if you don't have like yeah, a break or whatever. It does, it does get to you. Mm. The company that you, you're in, and obviously if it's a family member, you can't sort of really say, okay, I'm not going to hang around choose, with you anymore. You can't you? choose, but it, it, it does affect, that's do why it's so in, important in to get that breaks. person help, yeah. yeah, and support, which I'll be talking about later on. Mm -hmm. Angelina Jolie, um, she was depressed from the age of 14 into her 20s, and I think she, again, was set back in two, 2007 when her mother died, mm. but apparently World Mental Health Survey finds that most children or adolescents, uh, their first dealing with um, mental health is at 14 um, and but the ironic thing is in in places like the uh, usa here in the uk mm. under half of those people get treatment really? which is so like wow. i mean it's ridiculous so there's people who are obviously debilitated through depression and they just don't get help now whether it's stigma related or Probably. people aren't there to help yeah. or they don't know what to do but mm. that's just such a high Thing. it's really quite sad I mean it's, it's an awful thing to go through as you know as I know firsthand but yeah. just imagine not getting help for it and having to sort of think that you have to live with it is such a, a scary actually it's a terrifying thought mm, to say is. that this is it now for the rest of my life I'm gonna feel like this for the rest of my life it's mm. horrible but you can get help you can There's so much help and I guess there, there's yeah. different degrees of depression as well yeah. isn't there it's sort of yeah. minor but then you've got quite serious mm -hmm. no, no one should face it alone no, not mm -hmm. at all. Um, so the time 
The Time to Mind campaign is a manifesto written by psychologist Tanya Byron and she calls for greater investment into child mental health services, so yeah. more money to be put into it yeah. and obviously early intervention which is really important, yes. which is what really we've been talking Definitely. about. And that's championed by so many people but obviously Kate Middleton was one of the main yeah. people, who, she's now 33, she's a patron of lots of charities but one of her main ones is Place to Be. And she wants the stigma removed, um, wants children and parents to talk and teachers and to really look out in schools for anybody, yeah. that any children that need help and, and to, to help them get help. Yeah, which um, they can do. Yeah. Thank you so much, Helena. Really? She always looks shocked when, when they... Joking. You know, she always looks shocked when the end of the news segment. She can just go on forever. <laughs> oh, that could have been thank the whole so, show. Oh, oh my goodness. Thank, thank you so much, and we'll see you again next time. Hopefully you hang around and watch the rest of the show, because we are going to have a very interesting guest next. And we have Anne Alagba, who will be sharing her difficult past and how she fought through it, right here on The Chrissy B Show. Don't forget to subscribe to The Chrissy B Show, always aiming to show you the happier side of life. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to The Chrissy B Show. If you've just joined us, today is about child depression. And now we're very lucky to have with us Anne Alag Bay. Hello, Anne. Hello. How are you, sweetie? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Very well. It's your first yes. time on TV. Yeah. You were telling me earlier you're normally behind the camera. Yeah. Yeah, but now it's <laughs> I mean, now it's your turn. Bit. Now you know what it feels like. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you for actually coming on the show today because this is a, a difficult subject to speak about and it's the first time that you are sharing your story publicly. So we are going to look after you, so don't worry. And um, we're going to be, obviously, the main aim of this is to help viewers at home because I know you suffered in silence for, for quite a while yeah. before you actually got help. And we're going to show the viewers today that you don't have to suffer in silence, that it's good to speak up about things. So tell us where it all began for you, Anne. So it all started from a very young age. So I used to live in Manchester mm -hmm. and I went to school there, primary school, and I was the only black child in the whole of the school. The so whole of the school? The really? whole of the school, I was the only black child. Wow. So it was very like racist. Mm -hmm. um, the children, like they were very racist. They would call me like racist names. Like I used to live um, near some of them because we were like mostly neighbors. They would be on their bicycles and they'll be shouting that racist names at me. And it was very hard. Gosh. And like, it was very hard for my dad. My dad would react by getting angry. He was very, very angry. So uh -huh. um, that, is where it mostly started. Did it start from like the first day you went to school? Or? Yeah, yeah. Were you, were you, before that, were you actually looking forward to going to school and like a new experience? Or yeah, were you, like... no, I was very happy. I used to be excited to go to school. But it's like, as the years progressed, as I went from like year one, year two, like children, mm. they already start to pick up things. So they already started to pick up, oh, okay, she's kind of different. Like, she's not like us and then, they yeah. were really racist and it was very hard. So did you have any friends at all? I had one friend, but she was them ones where she, if I was by myself, she'll be my friend but in front of other people. Mm. She wasn't okay. there. Now, when you say that the kids were, <coughs> were racist, what, what kind of things did they used to do or, or say to you? So was it... Um, it was mostly calling me names. Mm -hmm. Like I used to feel like I'm rejected as well because already I was a very shy person. I was very, very shy. So to speak to people was very difficult. Mm. So um, I would feel left out, like rejected. And it was mostly like me being like away from the crowd. So if they would be in a crowd, I would be by myself kind of thing. How did that used to make you feel? Like? It was really, really bad. It, like that gave way to so many complexes. I had so many deep, deep complexes about myself and I was so young. Like what? Like, I thought I was ugly. My biggest complex was my looks. That was my massive complex. I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. Because of what the kids yeah. said to you? And how, yeah. how old were you at this time? I was like six. I was six very, years very old young. and you didn't yeah. want to look at yourself in the no. mirror? I thought I was ugly. I started to develop weight problems because I'm, I'm already quite slim. I'm a type of person where I don't put on weight, so I can only lose weight. And I noticed that. Wow. Yeah, so that's even deeper. That's, a... that's even deeper. I developed weight problems. No, I'm point. saying like, that oh, would be oh, like right. such a great so, thing for most people. Most so many people, people don't put weight. That. So many <laughs> but people for you, it was, a, it was very difficult. Yeah. So I would, li I would starve myself. I wouldn't eat on purpose. Because mm. that was like a relief like for me. So hang on, you, you said you would... 
you would starve yourself yeah. for what? Just to, to lose not... weight. So I could be skinny. So you couldn't lose weight normally, but you didn't want, but you weren't overweight, you said? No, I was very slim, but, um, but I lose you... weight easily. Okay. Yeah. But why yeah. were you starving yourself if you were Because I thought skin? I was fat, but I wasn't fat, but in my mind I was. So like all of the bullying just led way to so many unnecessary complexes kind of yeah. things. So like my looks, that was the major one. My weight, even though I was very skinny for my age, but I still, in my mind, I still thought I was big. So I would like... But would the kids tell you you were, you no. were big? No. It was just all of that built up from like wow. the racist comments, yeah. my mind. Cause so it's I was like you very, were trying to find yeah. more things, like why are they bullying me? Maybe it's because of this. Maybe yeah. Because if they'd never mentioned you, for example, if someone had said you're fat, that, that kind of makes sense that yeah. you were trying. But if they, no one did and you still thought you were fat, even though you're really slim, yeah. that shows how much it affected you it mentally. It affected me very, very bad. Like not eating. Um, I, was, um, I would self-harm. As well. Really? Yes. Because, at what age? Um, the self-harming started at eight, eight years what old. What did you used to do? So I would slit my wrists because um, um, I would always have my own room. I always had my own room. So whenever I was going to self-harm, I would just lock myself in my room. Where did you learn about that? Did you see that anywhere or was it just something that you no, would... No, it's just something I did. But like, why? What was, what was it that you would... Bec um, if you remember that? that yeah, no, because um, cause I had no one to speak to. Yeah. So it's like... I had so much pain inside of me, okay. but I couldn't open up to anybody. So my way of relieving the pain was inflicting more pain on myself. In a physical way. Yeah, so in you a more could, physical you way. You could like sort of, in a, in a sense, maybe you're thinking that that's going to relieve the emotional yeah. pain that you're going through. Yeah. Okay. And how, how long were you self-harming for? Um, like a year. A year? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, um, at school, when all of this was going on, did the teachers notice anything? Yes. What, what happened? The teachers, because I was very quiet. I was a very strange child. Like, if you saw me, you would notice there was something wrong. Because... You, <coughs> you weren't strange. You were just going for a lot yeah, of problems. Yeah, I was just going for a lot of problems. Yeah. But they knew that. But they just didn't know what, because I didn't speak. So I had um, counsellors. I didn't know there were counsellors, because I've never seen them before. But I had counsellors, like child counsellors, come in okay. and like speak to me. But I wouldn't open up. I wouldn't open up to them. Why, why wouldn't you talk? Because I suffered in silence and I just thought, yeah, I would just remain in silence. Like, well, you're afraid no point. to, to yeah. kind of... I was afraid and also I just, I just didn't see the point because I didn't really think anyone could help me. Okay. Yeah. Did you think maybe that you'd get into more trouble if, from maybe yeah. with the other kids if you said anything? Yeah, because um, the teachers knew about the racism, but it's like they didn't really do much to help wow. me. So they that's, knew, that's like, shocking. That is, yeah, it's really shocking. They knew, like, they saw, but they didn't really do much. Yeah, because all adults, <coughs> any adult, has a responsibility towards any child that they see. You know, is going through a hard time. That's terrible. Now, Anne, how um, how did things progress as you got older? Because you know, did, did the bullying stop at at some point, and then, yeah. but did your feelings and emotions continue? The, the mental effects. Yeah. So the bullying stopped at year seven. Mm -hmm. So um, I came to London um, when I was eight. Yeah. So I started to live permanently here. And I went to secondary school here. And like, it continued into secondary school, but it stopped halfway. Because um, then I decided, okay, no, I'm not going to be bullied anymore. So I would hang around with like the wrong crowd. Okay, yeah. to kind of protect yourself. Yeah, to protect yeah. myself. Even though like the crowd I was hanging around with wasn't helping because we would all gossip about each other, kind of thing. So it's like it still continued because there was still so, like toxic friends. Yeah, basically, basically yeah. toxic friends. Mm -hmm. So I hung around with the wrong crowd, and even though the bullying stopped, the inner conflict didn't. Okay. So like it's like the insecurities deepened. Mm -hmm. So the things with my weight it deepened even more to the point people would say to me, "Anne, you look ill," because I would lose so much weight, and people would say, "Anne, you look ill. Like you need to put on weight." Were you ever diagnosed with an eating disorder? No, I wasn't, because I never told anybody. Okay. Yeah, so I didn't tell anybody. And, um, yeah, so the things with my looks continued as well. Mm -hmm. I still couldn't stand the way I looked. And, like, I couldn't speak to people. Like, the shyness continued. Yeah. Okay, now I know, and you eventually got help for your issues. You yeah. found the charity and help centre, yeah. uh, which had a youth group as well, which you joined, and you got a lot of help and support. You're finally able to open up. You also received spiritual help as well. So 
at this stage now, how do you feel about yourself and is the past still affecting you? At this stage, I'm completely different. Mm -hmm. Like, I no longer have complexes about myself, the way yeah. I look, or like any problems like eating or anything like that. Um, my do you know past... you're gorgeous? Thank you. Do you see that now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But um, my past is my past. It doesn't yeah. affect me anymore mm -hmm. at all. Like all the people that hurt me and stuff, I don't feel any resentment against them mm -hmm. or anything like that because people bully for a reason. Mm -hmm. Nobody wakes up one day and says, oh, I'm going to bully this person. It's all for a reason. So it's like my past, I just use it to help other people. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to use it like to weigh me down. It did for a while, but yeah. as I continued to come and stuff, I finally was able to let go. Okay. And what did it feel like um, during your recovery and actually feeling so different about yourself, what was that like? <coughs> it was very hard. Like, um, when I first came, like, to receive help, because of all that I'd been through, I still had that with me. Mm -hmm. So I would think, oh, no, especially in the youth group, oh, no, these people don't like me because I suffered that before. Oh, so they were like, obviously very friendly yeah, towards you. Yeah, they were you. very friendly, but still I had in my mind, no, they don't like me. Like, oh, I was very paranoid. That's one problem yeah. I had. Yeah. But um, I started to see, okay, no, these people actually do care and they're mm -hmm. able to help. So it was very nice because I was finally able to open up to somebody, okay. which I never did. I had an advisor that was helping me yeah. and like I would open up to him and stuff. And like he would advise me, telling me that, you know, I can like my past is my past. And mm -hmm. the youth group, the youths are there for me and stuff. Brilliant. Yeah. Right, and you're going to stay with us because um, after the break, we have another guest joining us, which is Dr. Nihara Kraus, who's a clinical psychologist. And she's going to be commenting on your story and also helping our viewers at home that, you know, you know, understand more about child depression. Yeah. All right. So guys, do stay with us. And if you've had a similar experience like Anne or have one of your own and want to share your story, do get in touch by filling in the form on chrissybshow.tv or let us know your thoughts or advice on this subject by tweeting us at chrissybshow or commenting on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. I'll see you in a second. Don't forget to subscribe to The Chrissy B Show, always aiming to show you the happier side of life. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to today's show where we are discussing child depression. It's a very hard topic to address, but it's important that we do and that we are vocal about it so that hopefully we can help those who need it. So just before the break, we had Anna Lagba who told us how she got through one of the hardest times of her life, which did lead to her having depression. Now, if you've missed this, you can watch this episode and all of our other previous shows on our YouTube channel, The Chrissy B Show, and also subscribe there. Now, before we move on, we're going to play you this video of when I visited the Dolphin House Charity, a pioneering natural health charity that provides a range of therapies for both adults and children. Check this out. Today we're actually in Brighton visiting a very lovely charity called Dolphin House and I'm here with one of the founders, Rosie Barnard, who's going to be telling us why the charity was set up in the first place. Hi Rosie, how are you? Good to be here. So tell us about the charity, why did it start and what was the thinking behind it? Dolphin House started uh, in the early 80s. Uh, the thinking behind it was that uh, children you know, who, who were poorly would get better a lot quicker uh, Julian Scott, who started the charity, he treated me for asthma and uh, when I first, first started going to him I was really, really chronically ill and at death's door and after a couple of treatments I could for the first time be able to hold a conversation. I was so breathless before. He said, because uh, he got me well, I offered, I said, if there's anything I can do in return and he came back and he said, will you help me start the children's clinic? He held you to that word, didn't he? And, you know, obviously I'm happy to help because it was so amazing to be well. And so when we started this children's clinic, it was real, you know, gamble. We just thought, you know, is it going to work or not? So we scrounged some premises and uh, we had one afternoon a week in a premise in Hove and it just absolutely took off. It, everyone was so keen to come that we had to find bigger premises and longer hours and uh, people were phoning me 
all over England, from Scotland, even people from Canada came. What we wanted to do was not discriminate against anyone and charge lots of money. So we set it up as a charity and then um, after that we said to people we did the payment on a sliding scale and even if people didn't have any money they could still come and have treatment. It's dolphin-house.org.uk if anyone wants to have a look. I'm here with Alison Lucas, who's one of the trustees of this charity. She's going to be telling us how the charity has developed over the years. Hi, Alison. Hi. So tell hi. us how things have moved on, because a lot's been happening since, there has, since yeah. the first beginning. Well, since Rosie um, told you the story about how the charity started, and then about 20 years ago, we moved to these premises here in New Road, mm -hmm. and we've developed the number of treatments that we do now. So we still do acupuncture for children. And we also now do osteopathy and homeopathy and mm -hmm. creative arts therapy. And then we also, as I mentioned, we sell the supplements. So we have a whole range of uh, mm -hmm. different supplements. And um, a couple of times a week, we actually have a fully trained nutritionist working in the shop. So they're able to advise that all the people that work in the shop um, mm -hmm. are very knowledgeable about therapies and uh, are able to advise people on what they're buying. Okay. And, and I see some makeup there as well. And natural <laughs> makeup, yes. Um, I believe we're one of the very few, if not the only, um, shop in, in Brighton that actually sells natural makeup. Oh. And uh, so we have a couple of different ranges, and mm -hmm. uh, it's very popular and uh, yeah. nice that people are making their faces look beautiful but naturally. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So actually one of the things I, I did notice as soon as we walked in was the, the hospitality, how friendly everyone was. So it is really a nice family environment. So if you do want to come down yourself and use the services, come to the shop, or if you'd like to support the charity, please do visit the website on the bottom of the screen. It's another great charity. Now, uh, before we go back to Anna's orb, let's please welcome our resident consultant, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nihara Kraus. Hello. Hello there. Welcome Hello, back. Sir. Thank you. Love having you on the show. Oh, it's very nice to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so you heard Anne's story yes, um, earlier. Did. What did you think of, of her story? Um, well, I think Anne raises a very important point because although we know uh, many of the causes of childhood depression, um, which were mentioned, you know, things to do with unresolved grief, um, or loss, uh, mm -hmm. change, parental separation, difficult experiences. I think one of the main causes um, for children to feel unhappy initially and then get depressed is feeling as though they're not part of a peer group. Right. It's extremely okay. painful to feel like you're an outsider, that perhaps you're different. Mm -hmm. um, and then children make all sorts of interpretations based on that. Uh, they think they're worthless, they think that they're the people who can perhaps have issues around fitting in mm -hmm. um, and that can lead to a whole load of negative and mistaken um, impressions about themselves. Right. The impact being depression with yeah, time. Yeah. Now obviously, um, and you mentioned self-harm and I was quite surprised because she hadn't sort of heard of it, of it before or has anyone no one spoken to you about doing anything like that no. so it was just something that you discovered on your own is that quite common for like children just to <coughs> do that without having heard of self-harm or anything because obviously i know there's a lot of stuff on the internet nowadays about yes. it but yes she did well she didn't i think know. often children find it very difficult to express what it feels like to have depression or to mm -hmm. be depressed so you have a very high number of children who say they're in pain they yeah. present with a lot more symptoms of pain, stomach pain, um, headaches, all sorts of body pains. Mm -hmm. And um, another way of coping with or expressing pain is to self-harm. Uh, physical pain can sometimes seem almost more bearable or mm -hmm. within your control. Yeah. Um, and so children will therefore kind of sometimes follow through with self-harming, which is right. why it's important when a young child presents with self-harm to try and really find out what the cause behind it is. Yeah. Now, um, talking about the, the parents now, what should parents or even teachers maybe look out for yeah, there's, um, there's to a see number if a of, child... Yes, there's a number of signs. A lot of them are similar to adult depression and then some of them are quite different. Mm -hmm. uh, if a child uh, or a teenager presents with sort of chronically uh, low mood, so they've been unhappy or they seem low for quite a long period of time and that's dip uh, different to their usual mm -hmm. demeanour. Okay. Um, if they have withdrawn, uh, if for example they don't seem to be enjoying the things they usually do and certainly things like music or mm -hmm. going out with their friends or you know child things that interest uh, children, uh, yeah. that would be a sign. 
Um, teachers often say, subject teachers can often pick up things, so English teachers will say that often there will be very dark poems right, or yeah. bits drawings that are written. Well Same with mm. art teachers, we'll talk about drawings that convey a sense of uh, darkness, despair or, or sadness. Mm. Um, music, you know, uh, there might be certain forms of music that appeal to children who are depressed because it kind of is in accordance with their mood. Right. Um, and the difference, I think, often is that sometimes children who are depressed um, appear to be very aggressive, irritable, mm. moody. Uh, they might be very, very kind of difficult to manage. It might show in their behaviour. Uh, there might be feelings of guilt that they constantly express, sense of, you know, no sense of a future, or if the future is described, it'll be very mm -hmm. bleak, very dark. Um, so those would be some of the signs to watch okay. out for. And in terms of treatment for, for children, what, yes. what's out there, what's available? Um, there's, there's a range of treatments. What we mm -hmm. know in terms of mild to moderate depression is that exercise is almost equally as successful as um, antidepressants. Oh wow. And that's okay. the same for adults yeah, actually. Yeah. Um, so uh, activities, exercise, obviously talking to somebody mm -hmm. because part of depression is to create a very negative outlook and the more negative you become it becomes a bit like a trap. You, yeah. you feel locked in mm -hmm. to this very negative world and you keep spiralling further and further downwards. Mm -hmm. So to be able to talk and be able to get a different perspective there's a whole range of psychological treatments that are available mm -hmm. and for children there are some very good internet web-based treatment programs that you can follow. Yeah. Um, there are school-based programs that are again available, things that combine mindfulness mm -hmm. alongside with particular targeted treatment now strategies. Now you do special work in schools with this, don't I you I do actually? lots of work. Yeah. In fact, the charity that I set up four years ago, uh, one of our areas, our key areas, is depression yeah. uh, because it's often overlooked and people don't mm -hmm. recognise it. And in, with boys in particular, a lot of teachers think, oh, they're kind of just difficult to manage. They've got bad behaviour or um, you know, they kind of completely under um, diagnosed or picked up. Yeah. Uh, so I do a lot of work with schools, um, mm -hmm. helping both young people but also teachers um, and parents on how to pick up on early signs and what they can do. And most importantly, telling young people that there is a thing called depression yeah. uh, and that yeah. it's important to yeah. talk about it. Because I don't know, Anne, when you were at school, whether people even knew, whether you knew that there was something called depression. No, no, she didn't. No, she just didn't. had it and didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, and that was okay. so helpful. Um, yeah. And often I have got young people when I talk to them. In fact, I was at a school just a couple of days ago, and uh, I had a girl come up and say, "I didn't, I didn't know that that was depression." And that's amazing. So people need to yeah. need to be definitely educated. <laughs> yes. So what would your final message be, um, Dr. Prowse? Final message is um, depression is something that can make you feel very alone and isolated. Mm -hmm. The biggest step you can take is to make a connection. Yeah. Um, and, you know, talk to someone about yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. How about you? And what would you say to maybe uh, young people that are going through something like this? Or maybe they're in the adulthood already, but it's still affecting them from when they were a child. What would you say to them? Is there hope? Yes, there is hope. Um, you may feel like there's no one there for you, but it's a mm -hmm. case that there's other people out there who have gone through the same thing that you're going through and they're able to help you. So it's about just finding like the right help out there. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, ladies. Great speaking Thank to you. you. Thank you. Well, don't go away because after this quick break, I'll be sharing my own wisdom on how to help your child if you find that they're depressed. Only here on The Chrissy B Show. Don't forget to subscribe to The Chrissy B Show. Always aiming to show you the happier side of life. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show and this episode is all about the difficult subject of child depression. So how can you as a parent help your child who is depressed? So let's look at the first points. First one is to stop playing the blame game. Now I want to look at two different scenarios here. Now in my case, I had a great family. I couldn't have asked for better parents. I had all the love and attention in the world and really had everything that I needed, but still I got depressed because of inner issues I was going through. 
but I also know that as a parent, it's really, really easy to blame yourself and often it's not your fault. And actually you could even end up getting depressed because of what your child you know, is going through. So that's the first scenario. But what if you actually do have something to do with your child getting depressed? I was speaking to a mother not so long ago and she was really, really distraught because um, she used to argue a lot with her partner and like the one of her her middle daughter would witness everything and her daughter ended up getting really really depressed she uh, became very withdrawn and she had so many issues she then got bullied at school because the way she would you know the way she would sort of act around people so in that case you could say that you know the the parents did have something to do with the child getting depressed and i even did speak to the daughter as well and she she confirmed that be because of all those things, she did get really down and she started to self-harm. It led to so many different problems. So say, for example, if you are maybe that parent that did kind of contribute, obviously not willing, wanting to, but you did contribute to your child being depressed. Either way, what's the point of beating yourself up? How is that going to help you or your child? So the best way, the best thing that you can do to help your child is to put all those unhelpful feelings aside because it's actually zapping away your energy and put all that energy into thinking straight and helping your child to recover because as I said before, full recovery is possible. So let go of the guilt, let go of the blame and now put all your strength, all your focus onto helping your child get through this, through this difficult time. So the second point is, is it a medical problem? Now, there are some medical problems that can cause children and teens to feel low. So please do get your child checked out first to see if there is anything going on physically that's affecting them mentally. The third point is to encourage dialogue. So, you know, encourage your child to open up and talk about what they're feeling and the things that may be happening around them. So maybe there's there's issues at home. Say, for example, that um, things are going on, there's trouble, there's arguments in the house. Don't just assume your child doesn't get affected by it or doesn't want to talk about it. Maybe you try to hide things, certain things from your child. Maybe something's going on in the family and you kind of try and deal with it or not talk about it in front of them, but they, know, they feel the atmosphere at home. So talk to them as well. Don't sort of assume that they're too young, for example, to, to hear certain things. You'll be surprised actually how much children can pick up and how intelligent they are as well. So, you know, get them to talk about their feelings as well, you know, maybe what's going on at school, um, something that might be bothering them. And if, for example, it is a case where, for example, they're being bullied at school, do make sure that you also take the necessary action for that as well. The fourth point is to encourage healthy living. Now, as we heard from Dr. Krauss earlier, she said um, some many, many cases, I think she said half of cases can be actually um, dealt with. Depression can go just by encouraging a healthy lifestyle. So don't forget the basics for good mental health, which are a good healthy diet, enough sleep, exercise and positive relationships with people around them. So it might not in some cases solve everything, but it will contribute in a very positive way. And you can also try encouraging your child to limit the time they are in front of the computer and plan more outdoor activities. Because, you know, as I said earlier, it's shocking to see how children seem to kind of be addicted to their phones and their tablets and their iPads and playing games all the time. And of course, that's going to affect them mentally as well. And also talking about a healthy diet, we also have our resident chef, Hannah Richards from the Move360 Kitchen to give us some delicious, healthy recipes that are great for children as well. And they can even get involved in making these things. Check this out. Hi, my name's Hannah and this is the Move360 Kitchen. Today, I'm going to show you how to make one of my favorite desserts, which is called Monkey Nut Pie. So here I've just frozen two bananas. Well, kind of frozen them, but they just need to have a, they need to be cold. So two bananas, chopped. Put them into the blender, like that. And then take a nut butter. There are lots of really good, healthy nut butters these days. Um, so make sure you choose a really good quality brand and two tablespoons into the blender as well. And then this is just coconut milk. So we're gonna pour some of this in. 
and it's a little bit thicker than coconut milk and so it gives it a nice consistency. Okie dokie. And pour it out. The more banana you put in, then the thicker that will be. So that's a sweet treat for children when you don't want to feed them really sugar, sugary laden ice creams. Monkey nut pie. So thank you very much to Hannah. Now let's go to our next point, which is provide quality time. Now, your child really needs you right now. And even if they push you away, as you know, I did with my family at the time, it's just because they're confused. It's not because they don't need you or they don't love you. It's just that they're going through so many emotions at the moment that they don't know how to deal with. And sometimes they may kind of push you away and be rude to you and, you know, say things that they don't mean, but it's not because, you know, they, they don't need you because this is the time where they need you the most actually so be encouraging and watch what you say as well don't say anything like snap out of it because they're not doing it on purpose they're not feeling that way on purpose they can't help the way that they're feeling so if you kind of say things like that or you know don't worry you're so young you've got your whole life ahead of you all those kind of comments don't help them so be there for them just to listen as, as we said earlier as well and also your child you have to remember your child isn't making symptoms up it might look for example, they're just being lazy or difficult, but these are actually symptoms of someone that is depressed. So encourage them, even if they don't do anything great at home, still find things to compliment them about, to make them feel valued. Highlight things that, you know, the positive things that they do, rather than, you know, what you don't like about what they're doing. And also help your child wherever you can to look at things in a different and more positive way. So if you see that they're being very negative about a certain situation, don't tell them off, but just trying to sort of say things in a different way to them that can make them think about things differently as well. And the, the last point we have is that you're not alone. Now, as I said earlier, sometimes parents do tend to feel guilty about all sorts of things, but you have to remember if your child is depressed, it doesn't mean that you failed as a parent. Um, and especially if your child doesn't recover just with your help only. Some situations are a lot more deeply seated and you need outside help. So please do make sure that if your child has a treatment plan that it's followed and also you, that you have support around you and there's lots of help plans you can call. And if the case is more serious, please do make sure to watch out for signs of suicidal tendencies. And these could be, for example, if your child sort of mentions about suicide or they, you see them looking on the internet about suicide. And if, especially if they start giving belongings away, that's normally a big sign if they just start giving things away because it just means that maybe they're not going to be around. So do make sure to look out for things like that if the case is more serious and make sure you have people to call and people to help. And there are lots of charities and youth organisations as well as we heard from Anne earlier and they deal with these kind of issues. And actually if you do want some really good ones, we have some listed on our website under Use for Organisations on chrissybshow.tv. So just to recap our points for today. So the first one is to stop playing the blame game. The next point was, is it a medical problem? So make sure you find out if it's, you know, something that's actually a medical thing that's making them feel the way that they are. The next point was to encourage dialogue. Make sure you talk to your child. Also encourage healthy living because that could really make a huge difference to the way your child feels. And the next point was to provide quality time. Even if you have to take time off work to help your child get through this, they need you. And the next point was, you are not alone. You don't have to do it alone. There's lots of help and support out there for you. So never lose hope. I believe there's always a solution to any problem you may have or may be facing right now. And just do it all one step at a time. Now, depression in general is a very difficult and sometimes lowly condition to have, but you can treat it and you can get through it. And to tell you the truth, you end up a much stronger person afterwards than ever. Trust me, I've been there. So I'm also here to help you. So if you ever need someone to talk to, I'm always here for you. Just contact me by filling in the form on chrissybisha.tv and I'll get back to you. And you can also read more about my battle with depression and panic, panic attacks on my website, mylifeafterdepression.com. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for today. 
But if you do have a story to tell us, an experience to share, and to help educate, inspire, and motivate others, do contact us by filling in the form on chrissybshow.tv. And remember, you can also get in touch by tweeting us at chrissybshow or comment on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. Till next time, bye-bye for now. So good to see you. Good to see you too. So a very a, a difficult. <laughs> uh, <laughs> deep breath. I'm here with you. You are. You are not alone. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> My husband's grandparents, they normally bring a whole suitcase full of fried fish back from Guyana. 